To my darling rave heroines, the mystery has got to be solved, Henry Darger. Rain Girl marches to Sun Girl and takes one end of the banner. They stretch it out between them. Then the words disappear and projected onto the banner now are two pictures by Henry Darger joined together. One is an interior with girls dressed prettily, holding hands and playing. The other is a storm with girls running from soldiers, and there are wounded and dead bodies of soldiers as well as girls on the ground. We hear a mysterious baritone voice from somewhere in the darkness upstage. The realms of the unreal happened because of a war caused by a child slave rebellion. The enemy wants to enslave the children. We must fight and fight and keep fighting to protect ourselves. The description of this war is the greatest ever written by an author. And the title of this fabulous, fantastical story is... The Story of the Vivian Girls. In what is known as the Realms of the Unreal, of the Glendico Angelinian War Storm, caused by the Child Slave Rebellion. Henry Darger steps through the center of the painting, breaking it into two halves and walks down stage. Sun Girl curtsies to Darger and Rain Girl bows. They then roll up their halves of the cloth. My darlings, the noble author wishes to help the pretty brave princesses and all the little ones that need care. Well, we plead for your help. There are so many battles. Armies of Landolinian soldiers appear from all sides. Some of the littlest girls cry out, Landolinians are killing us. Help, help. Mama, Papa, we have to look after them. Oh, God, please help. We try to free the children that are captured, and we try to help them escape. But be warned, some of the children do die. We see horrid things. But try to look serene. And the biggest tragedy was little Annie Ehrenberg. What really happened to her? The whole reason the war began was to solve her murder. What exactly happened to her is a mystery. It is a mystery that gets more complicated at every turn. Only I, Henry Darger, the great Dargerous author and artist and famous general, can untangle it. Out of his pocket, he takes a mass of tangled string and throws it to Rain Girl. She laughs. Darger exits. Rain Girl spins around wildly and shrieks. <laughs> you dirty little brat, you won't get away. She grabs Sun Girl playfully and binds her hands with the string. General Darger, find me. The spotlight fades on basket and ball left behind. Scene two, April 1911. A modest sitting room in working class Chicago. Detective Schmidt is ushered in by a woman of about 30 who pulls a shawl around her nervously. Questions. Questions. Journalists asking questions. Mrs. Barubek, I'm not a journalist. Same questions. My language, your language, daily sports, daily news, Czech questions, American questions, all the same. I'm from the 15th police precinct, ma'am. Detective Walter Schmidt. I'm truly sorry, Mrs. Sorry. Do you have children? No, ma'am, I don't. What do you know about losing a child? You don't know my Aliska. Mrs. Porubek, I have good news for you. We found a little girl in a gypsy camp about 30 miles from here. A, a girl who had been missing I know, for I know, this is not news. All people around here are talking about this, but this is dark-haired girl, 10 years old, not blonde, not five, not a least. But Mrs. Perubek, we are making progress, because if our inquiries lead us to that child, then we will find Elsie. How do you, how do you know that, detective? Excuse me, I forgot your name. Ah, uh, Schmidt, ma'am. Schmidt. I am called. If you have to ask more questions, sit down. Thank you. Oh, beautiful chandelier. Is it crystal? From the old country. Crystal. The only thing left. I used to have a velvet piano cover, but now I've put old shawl over piano. I teach singing in this room. Elsie is not allowed in here, but she comes because she loves this light. You wish to see her room, I suppose, detective. It takes your breath away. The light, the glass, raindrops. No, no, uh, Mrs. Barubek, uh, there's no need to see the room. Uh, I just want Every to... Every day uh, getting worse. 
Where is she? Where is my baby? She's five years old, only five. This is Peru, but I think I can say there isn't a policeman in this city who doesn't have Elsie's picture, who isn't checking day and night every child he sees, who isn't looking. You know I made a dress. The dress she is wearing, a red velvet dress from the ammo cover. One day she take off cover and wraps it like cloak, so funny, marching up and down. She stand under the chandelier and say, Mama, make me a princess dress. I say, yes, your majesty. She loves that dress. We want to investigate every possibility. No stone should be left unturned. That's, that's what our chief said. So, tell me. What do you want, officer? What more do you want me to say or do? We put life savings in reward. The whole city knows. Mary. Mary. You have a check name. <coughs> yes. In America, they call me Mary. Easy name for Catholics. But I am Carolina. Elise Scott, they call her Elsie. My people are from Bavaria. Um, not so far. Same stories. My grandmother told me, the king of the gypsies catches little girls. Gypsies are the worst. We are in America now, ma'am. The Chicago police force, very modern and very thorough, very helpful, like me. Um, I am taking personal interest in this case. You are very serious. Like my brother Thomas. Like you not tall. So, red dress. Red velvet dress. Bow in hair. Her hair is short, but still she like a bow. Black stockings. Shoes with laces. Why? They put the photograph in the newspaper. You have the photograph. Yes, yes. Uh, in the photo she has black eyes. What color were her eyes? Her eyes like this, pale blue aquamarine. My husband said cat's eyes. He gave me this for me, for her baptism. <laughs> she, she looks like a little urchin. Urchin. A, a little tomboy, am I right? Oh, she was like a son and daughter. People say, Mary, you make a boy now. And I say, why? Why I need more? She is perfect. She can sing like angel and always happy, running and climbing. Never afraid. I will uh, leave you in peace. My husband, he wants to go to the Pope, but instead of Pope, he goes to Psychic on the corner of Racine and Belmont. Go to Wisconsin, says this very helpful woman. Go to Wisconsin? Elsie's hiding behind a piece of cheese? Detective, find my little girl, please. Please, look, I will. Here. I give you something special. She opens a cabinet and brings out a sewing box. She takes out some strips of red velvet and gives one to him. From a piano cloth. From, from this, I made her dress. You take Thank you, Mrs. Perubin. Please. I, I know what this means. Please, Detective Schmidt, you have a good heart. She was my only fighter, please, please. Schmidt walks away into a pool of dark red light. He twists the strip of velvet as if it is a rosary. Then he wipes his brow with it and puts it in his pocket. Photo of Elsie projected on scrim. Rain girl, dressed like Elsie in black and white, walks across the stage. Sun girl enters dressed as Elsie also, but in color, in the red dress. They sway slowly and dance to an organ grinder's music. Scene 3, April 1911. Police precinct. Chief Detective McCleary at his desk. Where were you? I was at the Perubik's home, boss. Mrs. Perubik, trust me, boss. I heard there is a new gypsy camp along the Displays River. Yeah, there was, but they fled. Too late. There's a gypsy exodus from the entire Midwest. Maybe we should round up the child beggars on Maxwell Street. Some of them might have been used by gypsies. They, they might No, know. no. This child. The, the angel so holy whom God sends to me. You're some kind of Lutheran poet. <laughs> <laughs> Lutheran? No. Race Catholic like you, boss, like everyone else. <laughs> Didn't think Germans could be Catholic. <laughs> I su suppose you should know. <laughs> While you were gone, Wilson brought in a suspect, an organ grinder. Seems the guy was a stranger. 
kid was seen watching it. Around 10 o'clock, a block away from her home. About seven kids standing on the corner listening. He's in the lockup. What street corner? I'll door to door. You're always five steps behind, man. It's done. Your job, temperance parade. Too bad for you, it's Saturday. Uptight women. I warn you, they yap away about evil saloons. Walk alongside them, babysit, peace get. Parade? We're detectives. Yeah, yeah, but you're somebody's scheduling problem. Huh? Anyway, you're barely a detective. Chief McLeary, you can trust me with the parade tomorrow. But the Peru Bank, please? Lincoln Park Fountain, 8.30. Who said Jesus didn't like a drop of wine? Huh? <laughs> They'll start yapping against tobacco before we know it. <laughs> you don't smoke, Schmidt? No, Chief, absolutely not. <laughs> Those holier-than-thou women are creepy. Uh, I wouldn't touch them. I, I just wouldn't want to touch them. <laughs> you virgin, Schmidt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll take that for a yes. <laughs> Can I go, Chief? Scene four. April 1911, Saturday morning, park. Fountain. Morning light. Unusually warm for this time of year. Male and female marchers arrive. Two women hand out placards, framed canvas signs, hand painted on poles. They display images and slogans. One of a skinny child captioned, Drink steals children's food. Another, a mother with child, Help me to keep her pure. And a teary boy and a girl, Don't let, don't let the saloon have a chance on us. Rain child and sun child now are daughters of marchers. Marchers greet each other and each picks a placard from a pile on the ground. Henry Darger emerges from the crowd. He wears a long, greasy army coat. His build is similar to Schmidt's. He watches from a distance. Brothers and sisters, take your placards and your banners, one for each. Hey, hey, kids, stay out of the fountain. Get out of there. You ever told a man to stay out of a saloon, officer? Jesus let me out of saloon. Jesus saves. Thank you, Thank you Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The church against the saloon. Amen. Joy, temperance, and repose. Slam the doctor on the nose. Amen. Lips that touch the Think before you drink now and say, Shut the saloon. Shut the saloon. Drink steel. Shut the saloon. Attention. Attention. The children will sing, and after that, we begin our march. Oh, the words of the children send a powerful message, Inspector. I'm sure they do, ma'am. Quiet, please. Oh, my soul is very sad, my brain is almost wild. It breaks my heart that I am born a sorry drunkard's child. Oh, my soul is very sad, my brain is almost wild. It breaks my heart that I am born a sorry hey, drunkard's child. Do you drink? Oh, touch my me. soul is I very beg your pardon. My brain is almost wild. You officer, it breaks my heart you do not I touch the devil's child. water. Oh, oh no, 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 ma'am. Uh, devil's wild. water it never passes my lips. Nor tobacco. Truly, I say to you, keep out of school. See these little children. They battle the sins of their parents. Officer, do you have children? No, 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 ma'am. No children. I have no wife, no family. Well, as God the Father leads and cherishes us, so attention! Company march, single file! The crowd falls into step. Schmidt is about to bring up the rear with woman two. She stops to pick up banners, but there are too many. Oh, officer, I beg your pardon, please. These are very heavy. Could you help me? Darker sneaks up and grabs a placard and runs into the crowd. Hey! Hey, just a minute! Sing down, hey, liquor! Sing down, liquor! I need to get through. Let me go. Let me please. Believe. Please, hey, thief! The marchers melt away. Schmidt is alone. Mops his brow with his handkerchief, and the red fragment of red velvet falls out of his pocket. He twists it in his hands, scanning the scene. Behind a tree, he sees the placard that Darger took. It has been ripped to shreds. He picks it up, catches sight of Darger. You, police, stop. I said stop. You, Vandal, what's your name? Darger stuffs something inside his coat. Give that to me. Darger hands over the torn piece of canvas. It's an image of a little girl with her hands in prayer. We can see the picture because it's blown up on a screen. Why did you do this? 
What's your name? Answer me, what is your name? You do have a name, and you are required to give it to me as an officer of the law. The weatherman in the newspaper said it would rain today. It did not. <laughs> Knew he would be wrong. Yeah. It didn't rain on the parade. <laughs> Why were you here? The sign of the times and the rhyme of the crimes. <laughs> See, crimes. What are you up to? A little child sweetly praying. I'm on duty at the parade. Give me your name now, or I will... Shh. Shh. You want me to shout again? N Henry. Last name. Darger. Spell. H-E-H-E-N-R-Y-D-A-R-G-E-R. -E -E Darger. German, Arger, Argerlich means annoying. <laughs> this ein Agri Hermann. I should be at the march with the women and the children. Protect little children. From people like you, wise ass. Don't play stupid with me. Date of birth, 1892. Look older. Place of birth. <laughs> Chicago? I take that to be a yes. Address? By St. Anthony's Church. No address. So I take you to the precinct. <laughs> I, I live in a house. A house. Not a poor house. Where? Parishioner of St. Anthony's. The year is 1911. The month is April. The day is... Henry Darger, I will be forced to arrest you. Two blocks. Show me. Move. Darger starts to walk slowly. Schmidt grabs his coat and tugs him on. Faster. You're not old. Projection of streets of Chicago. They walk past an Irish bar. Music. These people at the parade, their fathers get drunk and do bad things. Drink makes you do bad things. Feel guilty, Henry? That's why you came to the parade? He grabs Darger by the collar. What did you use to slice that sign? Darger hands over a small knife. You round children with a weapon? Look at me. Elsie Porubek. What does that name mean to you? Schmidt takes the piece of velvet out of his pocket. This look familiar? Such a shame. Sweet girl. Her mother's pride and joy. Darger has stopped in front of a low-rise building. This building. I live here. Upstairs in this house. That is my window. Two floors up. My room. I, I pay rent on time. That native sycamore suffered badly in the storm of 1910, St. Anthony's, at the corner, and there, Frank's place, is where I eat. You do any kind of work? St. Joseph's Hospital. What do you do in a hospital? Darger walks up some steps and opens a screen door. Clean floors, clean latrines, roll bandages. I'm a good worker. It's not fair. It's really not fair. She shouts at me, accuses me of things I never did. Cool. Sister Agnes. I try to ignore her. I am a hard-boiled egg and will always be one. Sunrise this morning was 6.33 a.m. The newspaper is bad at weather predictions, but very good about fires. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Girls fell, elevator shaft, jumped from windows, mangled bodies, bloody pulp, suffocated, Horses drawing fire engines pulled back when they heard the cries. Ghostly cries. I heard it all. Huh, no way you could have heard that factory from here. Tell a lot of stories, do you? Lies? I am not a liar. He runs inside. Schmidt twists his piece of red cloth. A window is flung open. Tchaikovsky's 1812 on a phonograph in the room. 
Schmidt leaves. Scene 5, 15th Precinct, April 1911, Monday morning. How was your weekend, Schmidt? Me, I just lucked out. <laughs> what do you know? Luigi Locatorelli is on the crime beat today and as happy as a clam and garlic. He loves the Irish. What will he write? Mother, aged 34, beaten dead in a ditch. McClary's new recruit walked off the job. I didn't walk off. I pursued a suspect. Suspicious. And just who thought he was suspicious? A witness? No one. That's who. No one. What world do you live in? Leave no stone unturned. That's what you said. And we still are looking for anyone who might be linked to Elsie Perubik, the missing child. What I said was babysit a parade. <laughs> That's what I said. This wasn't a demonstration, a picket line. Bunch of women with signs on sticks. All you had to do was... Sir, I made a decision that it was more important. You show no sense of judgment. The man I followed was violent, suspicious, eyeing children. So you say, but no one else seems to have said I'm A sorry. creep said his motive was protecting children. You don't seem aware of what happened to that one. Again, I ask, well, what world do you live in? I cannot trust you even with a mundane routine task. <laughs> You're suspended, Schmidt. Endeavor. Your badge, leave it on the desk. But here's the part that makes me want to choke. I have to give you half pay. Those were my orders. I am sorely deprived of the pleasure of firing you. Scene 6, July 1911. Two months later, <coughs> Schmidt in shabby, crumpled civilian clothes. He's grown a mustache. He stands in the shadows in an alley. It is very hot. He is mopping his brow with a handkerchief. Trash cans are opened and closed in the distance. Dogs bark. Darger appears with a pile of papers under an arm. He doesn't see Schmidt. He rifles through another trash can and finds a Morton salt container with a girl holding the umbrella. He puts it into a sack. A woman opens her back gate and steps into the alley. You there, dirty little man, I've seen you before. Up to no good, I know. I will set my dogs on you. Get out of here! You scare my children, the police will get you. Don't come back again! You hear me? Do you hear me? Darker scurries off, Schmidt follows. Scene seven. An hour later at Frank's restaurant, stools at the counter. Frank is behind the bar. On the counter next to Darger is the Morton salt container. What a coincidence. Henry Darger. We meet again. Unseasonably warm. 74 degrees, I think. I will check the barometer. Afternoon. What can I get you, officer? Just coffee. Three sugars. Thank you. Mr. Darger. <clears throat> I see you brought some salt. That's quite the container. Even if it rains, the salt will pour. Clever, this advertising, boys. <laughs> Ever see the soap package with the little girl drying her butt? <laughs> Except for the towel, she's naked, isn't she? How about that? Salt is a necessary supply. This place, no shortage. Hey, Henry, I was clearing out the basement here. Little Nemo comic strips and some uh, Nick Carter Weekly. It's your lucky day. Thanks, Mr. Frank. You like the funny stew, officer? I'm a detective. Here's your coffee. Oh, oh, oh I, I, a detective. So, of course, you like Nick Carter detective stories. You would like that more, of course. Though your adventures probably are, are much more exciting. Detective, I feed this here guy every day, rain or shine, because he's a good Catholic. The best. Good Catholic? Why don't you give him fish? It's Friday. No fish! I will not! They put horrid tasting sauce on that fish. At the mission. He doesn't like to talk when he eats. Stomach twister. I'm going, Henry. Shame on you. Now you have me seeing little girls everywhere. Look, a buttercup butter. <laughs> Cowgirl. Who knew? 
Enjoy your meatballs. Scene 8. A few weeks later, office in St. Joseph's Hospital, August 1911. I can't remember when we took Henry Darger on. If you say it's three years, you might be right. We feel it is our duty to try to give these orphans a job. After they leave that place, you know. The mission. Well, technically that isn't the name of the institution. It's the Lincoln Institute for the Feeble-Minded. Catholic, of course. But you run a hospital. How can you find work for... Well, there's for... manual labor to be undertaken here. They have no skills to speak of, no talents. They seem unteachable. And they do the same manual task for years. I've never seen any promoted. Even if they are good workers, you can't leave them unsupervised for long. Hard to get them to even control themselves sometimes. What do you mean? Well, they are not exactly gentlemen. Your janitor, Henry Darger. Mm-hmm. Wait, you say you're a policeman? Do you have a... Oh, oh I'm on a study leave. No. no, he's not a janitor. Well, what would you call him? A custodian? Cleaner? Dog's body. <laughs> Yeah, well, <clears throat> he has tantrums. We keep him on. You see, our policy is forbearance, but he mutters and mumbles, which is annoying. But then there are his tantrums, and they call for me. Why are you here, exactly? Oh, a minor matter, Sister Agnes. A local resident complained that he has been making a disturbance behind her house. He seems to loiter in the alley and pick through the trash cans. Trash cans? I would never associate him with trash. He likes to clean. And he's very thorough, I can say that for him. Well, as Jesus said, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. Very good. Very good. Well. <clears throat> I hope that I have helped you. Oh, yes. You won't do anything. You won't say anything to him. You see, it isn't an official report. Oh, I will certainly have to. The name of the hospital is at stake. They're like children, you know. They expect the punishment to fit the crime. So a severe reprimand, that is what is called for. As I said, the asylum in Lincoln doesn't teach them anything. Do you have children, officer? Scene 9, September 1911. The Lincoln Institute for the Feeble-Minded. Rain and Sun Girl are dressed in uniforms. Rain Girl is mopping the floor on hands and knees. Sun Girl is sweeping with a broom, then hangs out washing. The director pays no attention to them. We have around 1,200 boys now. We cannot take more. Would you like a cup of tea? Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. Three sugars. It is a long way out here from Chicago. It seems hotter. We are 100 miles south. We are away from the city and crime. You came uh, by train? Yes. You make inquiries away from your beat? Of course. You go get some tea from our, for our visitor and go grab some uh, so here is the file you requested. As I wrote to you, uh, there is a reason to believe that he is dangerous. It's none of my business when they leave. I could not have known him. I was, oh, I've only been here for two years. As director, I have enough, more than enough. You understand, this, this is confidential. Henry Darger. Admitted in 1901, age of nine, and he left, it says here, six years ago. Sun Girl returns with tea. There was no one in the kitchen, so I made it myself, sir. Thank you. And there were no crackers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> She's very young, isn't she? Domestic servant, child of a, a local laborer. Did you know to work so young? I was preparing myself to meet loud, rough boys, but it's so quiet and so dark. You could never believe that children lived here. 
There are no toys, no games, no books. Well, we have books, but but really, uh, is it a, a policeman's job to come? The boys are out in the fields, harvest. It's healthy work. They come with unhealthy habits. We have to get that out of them. So you put them to work? Yes, of course. Our fees are laughably low, and many cannot pay anything. We need the farm to sustain ourselves. It is good for them to be far from the city and its vice. And Henry Darger was without vice? <laughs> well, here it says, through hot ash in a child's eyes, 40 wax with a pound, push younger child downstairs, 50 slaps on buttocks with shoe, set fire to towels in laundry, locked in cell four days. 1906, August 10th, age 14, tried to escape but caught by lasso by officer on horseback. <laughs> so you got what you need? You understand it is a, it's a different reg regime now. Lasso? <laughs> the Wild West in Illinois, like in Writers of the Purple Sage? The lasso was their favorite weapon. Can't see you as a cowboy director. No, no, no. Well, well then. Um, I will walk you out. You must see so much in Chicago, so many exciting adventures. We don't ride on horseback with lassos, Director. I'd say you have a great deal more drama here. Nope. Surveillance is all I have been doing lately. You have no idea. They exit. Rain Girl runs. Sun Girl rides a broom like a horse chasing after her. Throws a sheet over her head, and they are laughing. Scene 10, September 1912. Close to midnight. An Indian summer of the kind Chicago does so well. Schmidt is crouching in the shadows outside Darger's building. Darger's window is open. And the Ehrenberg is too successful as the leader of the child rebels and has made such rapid progress that this has enraged General Phelan, who has got permission to murder her. Annie, habited in her nightie, is seized by General Phelan, seized by the hair. He flourishes a razor, puts his hands on her mouth, starts to choke her, severs her chest open with the razor. Nighty turns red, nighty torn to ribbons, oceans of blood, red blood dripping from razor. Blood fires anger to frenzy, flashes fire from his eyes. The child unconscious lies, his fingers deep embedded in white throat, celestial child, Annie, poor benighted celestial child. He pokes his head out of the window. He pauses after each observation and writes it down in a notebook. 11.55, still warm but good breeze, moon, yellow green, ochre, no, chrome. Chrome and emerald, indigo sky, purplish indigo. High today was 78. It was a particularly clear evening with some clouds here and there. He pokes his head back in. Tchaikovsky starts. Schmidt in the lamplight wipes his brow, holds his notebook up to the lamplight, and writes. He slips off into the shadows. Scene 11. Four months later, January 1912, St. Anthony's Church. Darger is polishing brass candlesticks. A large crucifix hangs behind him. Schmidt is now wearing a long coat and fedora, smarter than Darger's coat. Darger is working away with his coat sleeves rolled up. Please make it snow. I can look at snow all day and stand at the window. If you make it snow, I'll come to Mass tomorrow one more time. Hiding up here, working. For Father Jerome, altar woman sick. Some kind of penance? <clears throat> this is first-rate polish from the hospital. January 13, 1912, 6 p.m. Henry Darger stole from the hospital. The church was out of polish. No need to get excited. I'll drop it. Same diocese. Diocese that robs its parishioners. I hate this place. It's an icebox. I could be by my fire in my room. 
Listen, ugly hair, mensch, you really, really annoy me. Months now I have been following you. Jesus, your dreary routine. I get nothing from you. I follow you, watch you, harass you. You're like a stone. Do you even remember my name? Shh. Shh. Schmidt. Refrain <laughs> from blasphemy. My first name? Walter. My job? Detective. A bad detective. I'm being punished. I have been punished. I'm being punished because of you. <laughs> They're never going to let me forget it. A mother with three kids was beaten up and killed. Poor children, huh? Poor children. Perhaps I should go to confession, talk to Father Jerome. Father Jerome does not whack on the hands with the shoe. Sister Agnes does that. Well, I will be back at work in a few months now. And they'll find a reason to punish me again. That's how it goes, doesn't it? Four months now and I'll be back. In my experience, the Cat of Nine Tales is especially brutal. Scene 12, May 1912. The Precinct, Detective Squad Room. Chief Detective McCleary is talking to two male reporters. Schmidt is standing to the side. Nothing that's a surprise happened here, as I said. So no clear verdict on whether she drowned or was attacked and suffocated, Chief? No, as I said, two coroners disagree. No water in the lungs. No water in the lungs. No, no water in the lungs. Unlawful homicide, probable circumstance of death, suffocation. Probable suffocation, not strangulation. One coroner thought it could be strangulation, discoloration marks on the side of the neck. Yeah, but more likely to be suffocation. Am I a coroner? <coughs> Does was it matter now? Huh? Why was she attacked? I suppose by pushing me for salacious details, you're just doing your job. <coughs> but it's my opinion that you guys enjoy making it lurid, taking it as far as you can go. Am I right? Or am I right? Abrasions on the side of the face, so mistreated. Body decomposed, but under muck and silt, so decomposition slow. You got a picture? See what I mean? Huh? Your idea of a pinup? Think about it. Little girl, been underwater a year. She was attacked. She was attacked. Well, what became of that organ grinder, Chief? That's a dead end. Nothing is a waste of time. We wasted time. Let him go. That was months ago. <laughs> you do your homework or what? Uh, did somebody tell her mother? Of, her, yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you think we can't run a police department? Of course. Somebody told her mother. <laughs> it was the mother identified the body. How did <clears throat> her mother identify the body when it had been in there for, for a year? Child had had a broken leg from a fall out of a tree, the mother said. It's a mess. You know, sometimes there ain't no joy in this job at all. I have nothing more for you. I mean, just get it. I need a few quotes. Always bang for more. <laughs> and the mother said when she saw the body, quote, it's you, my darling. Thank God we found you and you're not in the hands of the gypsies. End of quote. And you're not in the hands of gypsies. Now, wh why did she say that? I don't know. For her, being kidnapped by gypsies is a far worse fate than death. It's a cultural thing. <laughs> you say so, <laughs> you would know. You come for a beer, Gus? Yeah. They find her after all this time. Suppose we'll never know what really happened. Mystery. Yeah, and don't mention the damn organ grinder. Don't suggest there's anyone out there. Case closed. Do you hear me? We are still calling it a murder, though, aren't we? You still the Weisenheimer? Hey, Schmidt? <laughs> Ten days back on the job. <laughs> Look, you can't solve them all. 
What's wrong with a mystery? Don't try to come up with some story. They forced me to have you back. You understand? Yes. You are on part-time and on probation. Am I right? Yes. Good. No. Chief, a moment of your time, please. During the time I was suspended, I've been trying to get a chance to tell you. I made a study of the man I followed from the parade. Why? Sir, even though I didn't have my badge and gun, I thought it was my duty to follow up a strong hunch. Hunch? Surveillance. I had strategy, made judicious inquiries. Notebook full of... Can you show me this notebook? I would, but you would not be able to understand. <laughs> Toxic codes and, and, and voices, many at once. And then there is a religious trend. Goes to mass at least, at, at least three times a day. So he's a saint. Huh? And you talk in riddles. If you talk about this man, or Elsie Barubek again, you're dead here. Do you hear me? Yes, I do, sir. Okay. And we got a headless, an armless body, Foster Avenue Beach. You want this? Yes, Chief. It's good to be back. <laughs> Make me proud. Intermission. <laughs>
something worrying you. Could you speak up, ma'am? I'm having some trouble. Well, this is a library, detective. <laughs> <laughs> and the person is, the person's right. I, I can't talk very loud. I'm listening. Take your time, ma'am. Well, I'm sitting at the librarian's desk in the reference section upstairs. Do you know it? No, ma'am, but that doesn't matter. <sighs> well, it's a far right hand corner. It's a, a youngish oldish man, really. It's hard to tell, but he's been looking through it, consulting the newspapers, the newspaper archives. Yes, ma'am. The Daily News, April 1911. Ten years ago. Yes. I offered assistance, of course, and it became clear that he had been trying to locate a photograph. Yes. A photograph of a child. The five-year-old who went missing so long ago, but I do remember it clearly. She was Czech. It was in all the papers. She was a pretty little girl. I, Elsie. Uh, I can't remember her last name. It was Elsie P. I, well, that's all I remember. It was such a long time ago. Elsie Perubik was not the name? Yes. Yes. And the body was found in a drainage canal, if I remember. It was horrible. You're correct, ma'am. Yes, a long time ago. She was discovered just over a year after she went missing. A little child, five years old. Case never solved, but the files were closed as soon as the body was found. In my opinion, there is no time to close the files. But the official investigation has been over for years. Had to obey orders. Move on. Officer. If she were alive now, she would be 15. Strange to think. Why am I telling you this? Well, ma'am, between you and me, I think the killer of Elsie Perubek could still be found. You are speaking to the right policeman. Oh, yes. Oh, officer, now I'm probably wasting your time, and I'm sure it's nothing at all. You know, we get a lot of strange people in here, but he just looks... I'm looking at him right now. There is a far away look. He seems very agitated, and I have never seen him before. He's not a regular reader. And and I know that this is odd to bother the police. The city has enough problems. Ma'am, ma'am, you're just being fine. Anything suspicious. You're, after all, a professional, ma'am. Could you describe it, please? <laughs> um, he's odd. Uh, <laughs> ageless. If I had to give him an age, I'd, it's, well, it's hard to say. I, anywhere between 30 and 50. What is he wearing? Yeah. Well, when he came in, a long coat, like a soldier's coat, with no badges of rank, and it reeked. So 
some black pub beer are used to, you know, it's a public place, so we have to accept. Yes, yes. <laughs> but now he's taking his coat off, and I noticed that his shirt sleeves are cut off at the sleeves. I suppose it's his idea about summer costume. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like Robinson Crusoe. Have you spoken to him? Did he talk? Well, yes, about his search. And we are here to assist the public officer. He asked me for the newspapers of April 1911. He had to go to the stacks. Yes, uh, what did he say exactly? Well, he asked for the daily news of April and May 1911. I gave him an armful of bound papers. He's a man of few words. One might have said rude, but not rude. Just abrupt, brusque. And he doesn't look at you. He looks at the ground. Upset, I suppose. That's what I would say if I had to. He just seems very sad because he lost his picture. Thank you, ma'am. I wonder if perhaps I could stop by the library in a few hours. It, it is very important that I come. Oh, yes, of course. Very good. I'll come just before closing and take a statement. Oh, you think it's worth it then? Oh, yes, ma'am. And ma'am, you must not, I repeat, not discuss this with okay. anyone. No, no, you see, I just, I wondered if it, if it meant something to him, if he'd lost a child, perhaps, or if he'd lost a, oh, well, I don't know. Do you have a child, detective? <laughs> 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 well, I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have asked you that. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You have been very helpful. Most observant citizen. Very helpful. Act 2, Scene 2, September 1921. Later that night, Schmidt is outside Darker's room on a dimly lit landing. He knocks. Henry! Henry! Henry Darker, police! The door opens. Another tenant let me in. I have some urgent questions. Remember me? Walter Schmidt. I went back to being a detective. I have my badge. <laughs> this is my home. My room. Leave me alone. I need to talk. No. Tomorrow. This cannot wait. I've waited ten years. Henry. Henry, were you in the library today? In Chicago, September can be warmer than August, 83 degrees. Were you at the library, Henry? It was not predicted. I made a public, you made a public disclosure today. Are you aware of that? It is a public library. I have a right to go there. The lady at the desk, at the reference desk in the library, telephoned me. She said you were very upset. You need to know, Henry, that you are under suspicion. I was looking. Looking for what? Photograph. What photograph? My lost photograph. You lost the photograph? What kind of photograph, Henry? A picture. A picture of what? A girl. Elsie Perubik? I lost it. You lost a photograph of Elsie Perubik. When did you get a photograph? The newspaper, I, I cut it. Why? Why was the girl in the picture? She was an angel, a shining angel. Men have killed angels before, Henry. Let's go back to basics. Where did you keep the photo? On the wall, in my room, in here. Show me the wall. No! I did nothing. I went to the library. You cannot... Punish me for going to the library. I want to look at this wall. No. Stolen. It was stolen from my locker in the hospital basement. Your locker? You said it was on your wall. My locker, yesterday. Lunch at Frank's. I don't like turkey, but that's all I had. <laughs> at 12.20, I opened my locker. I saw the picture was gone. I could not work. I hid in the janitorial closet. It was the same severe shock that I received when I heard of the death of my father. I could not weep. I could not cry. I had that kind of deep sorrow that, bad as you feel, I could not. In the closet, there was a picture of Jesus. I hid it. 
with my fist. I wanted to burn it. Lost or stolen? It's never good to change your story. You are indeed, Henry. A little Czech girl went missing ten years ago. Why do you care? You're not Czech. You knew her, didn't you? Since yesterday, I have not eaten. After the library, I went on a long walk, much longer than usual. Today, I balled up plenty of twine and threw them at the wall, singing while having difficulty with twine as a help. But yesterday, I could not sing. I know your squalid square mile, Henry. Church, Frank's restaurant, the alleys, the hospital. Not the hospital, Sister Agnes is dangerous. She has some bad thing to say about you. Sister Rose is in charge now. Then I will talk to Sister Rose. And Sister Agnes, I will show no mercy. I am going to hunt you down and trap you. I will be there when you go to Mass. 7 a.m. Schmidt makes his way down the stairs. Henry goes into his room and closes the door. Schmidt opens and closes the front door, but he does not go out. Instead, he climbs back upstairs and sits close to Garber's door. He wipes a brow with a new handkerchief and scribbles in his notebook, straining his ears. Silence for a while, and then... Hail, holy queen enthroned above Ave Maria. Hail, mother of mercy and of love Ave Maria. Our life, our sweetness here below, Ave Maria! Our hope in sorrow and in woe, Ave Maria! Adults should really not sing, <laughs> not in public. <laughs> hey, tell me, have you something important to say? Speak up, for it is rascally to keep secrets. Indeed, I can tell you about the great Ehrenberg mystery, and it will reverberate in countless echoes. There is much I can tell you, for I am a man acquainted with grief and sorrow. I know of these matters and the circumstances of her ending. Shall I tell you? I wish you would. I can think of no one better qualified than yourself to open this up to me. I will tell you. Listen, this is how it happened. Even though I was a general, I was often lukewarm about the fighting. And one day, at one battle, it does not matter to describe it. Now, I was unable to take the roar of the musketry any longer. <laughs> So, as I was saying, I left the scene as quickly as I could. I was suddenly aware of a person following me. She was a little girl, the very likeness of the one in the picture that I had lost. Little one, I said. It ain't polite to scare a man like that. She looked at me with her big eyes and said pleadingly, my name is Annie Ehrenberg. I was cruelly murdered, as you know. This is the second time I have appeared to you. I asked you to avenge my murder. I trusted you with my pictures, but you let it get stolen. It ain't my doing, and you know it. The loss of this photograph is responsible for the situation of this war. The return of the picture must be forthcoming in order to bring about the success of the Christians. I rode up close to her, expecting her to dart away, but she looked at me with a look of reproach in her eyes. I am not your enemy. I have tried to grant your request. I have invaded the Glendalinian public libraries, but without success. As it is fair in war, I would have seized the book of newspapers that the picture was in, but I could not trace it. 
Though I examined book after book, you must believe me. I beg you. I am trying, but God seems intent on obstructing my efforts. I am angry with him. I have not been to confession for weeks. It ain't easy. But, oh, I turned around. But she disappeared into the placid waters of the river. I thought, sure. I saw that beautiful child in the water with the lily pads all around her. All I could see was her face, her eyes so large, and such an imploring look in them. Her arms extended, as if beckoning her to me. <laughs> there is silence. Schmidt takes the piece of red cloth out of his pocket and wraps it around his wrist, pulling it tighter nervously. He gets up slowly and walks away, as if in a daze. Act 2, Scene 3, October 21, 1921. Darker's Church. Father Jerome and Schmidt are sitting in a pew. Sun Girl is kneeling in front of a painting. Father Jerome and Schmidt speak softly. I was struck by how similar you and Mr. Darga look. <laughs> I remember you speaking to him. Oh, oh don't misunderstand. A, a resemblance only in uh, certain aspects. Uh, yeah, forgive me, but uh, I, I never remember names. Detective Walter Schmidt, and you are Father Jerome. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, you <coughs> shame me. <laughs> you, you started to come to mass. What happened? Faith waxes and wanes, <coughs> Father. It has been ten years. Autem lux in tenebris lucet. <laughs> But faith shines in the darkness. Does it? <laughs> I dropped it on my way to work. I'm looking for someone. Oh, you are here. That's all that matters. Is it? Well, now you come on St. Ursula's Day. Means little bear. <laughs> A certain robustness about the name. I like it. <laughs> that young girl over there has come because it's her name day. There is a St. Walter, did you know? Feast day is in April. Yeah, but now this one has a dramatic story. Uh, Father, I came specifically now, to she, talk she to... She was a daughter of the Christian king in England. And the king of the Huns wanted her hand in marriage. She and 11,000 handmaidens set sail. Father, I have now, to... When she have... saw the king of the Huns, she said first she had to go on a pilgrimage to Rome. I think it was an excuse, poor child. She found him old and ugly. <laughs> now, he refused to let her go, so she set out nonetheless, and so he slaughtered her and her handmaidens. Yeah. All virgins. Some say there were 11,000. Hans, I'm German. The war is how long it oh. <laughs> before you... <laughs> no, I apologize. I, I have upset you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, please. But we're talking about the 10th century. <laughs> you know, when you frown, you really do look like him, <laughs> Mr. Darger. <laughs> I hope that's not impertinent of me. But, Mr. but Henry Darger's father was also German, I believe. Though sometimes he has said he hails from Brazil, and then he calls himself Dargerus <laughs> and pretends to speak in uh, Portuguese. In a way, it is charming, endearing. Some adults never lose their childish imagination. He has a kind of holy innocence. Sancta simplicitas. Does he ever say one thing that is true? Now, come, come. Let me show you some of the new art on our walls. A wealthy patron, St. Agnes. Artist unknown, a copy, of course. The flames wouldn't burn her, so you see, the soldier is trying to cut off her neck. <laughs> Father, I didn't come here for a tour. Now I really have to go. Well, glad to see you, no. Father. Keep the faith. Veritas Christo et Ecclesiae. <laughs> Make it come back, please. Make it come back. I will extend the deadline. One more month. I will not annoy Sister Agnes. I will not throw balls of string. <laughs> I will build an altar in my room. Hello, Henry. Bargaining with God? I am praying. 
We made an arrangement, seven in the church. I did not make an arrangement. Oh, Father, I promised to do all. Here, I have brought you this. He takes out the red cloth. Darger stops praying but says nothing, looks at it and bows his head again. Are you a mouse? Doesn't this mean anything to you? I will build an altar in my room. I am a sorry saint. A sorry saint. Sorry? Henry, I have never searched your room. See this badge? This gives me the right of search. Now I have the authority. An official search is justified. Are you going to voluntarily let me in, or shall I bust my way in and trash your room? No, no one touched me. It is not trash. No, no. Get no. up. You let me in, and I will methodically search. You resist, and I will turn your room upside down and inside out. Inside? No one enters my room. No one. Inside, you do not. It, it will. It will all. <laughs> Stop the gibberish! Get up! We're leaving now. Darger gets up and they move towards the door, passing the kneeling girl. Grant my step. Defend me against the spirit of evil. But above all, dear Saint Ursula, guide me and deliver my soul, so that I may praise, contemplate, and love God forever and ever. Act 2, Scene 4. Later, October 21st, 1921. Darker's room. Three long pictures. One on the table is half finished. A second is pinned on a wall, and a third is on the floor. All of them are projected onto a backdrop. Schmidt is snooping around, and Darker is following. What kind of tale is this? Very, very powerful when flung at a heathen. Whiplash effect. A human-headed dragon? Blending it. Official name, Lengenominian Monster. Some distant similarity with the dragon, but not essentially from the same family. This one has a cat's head. Why? They come in all shapes and sizes. These soldiers running away from the little girls, what kind of... Bad day for the Confederates. <laughs> Devil's Den, second day on the field of Gettysburg. You have all the ranks? Mostly officers. What do you call this? Frock coat. And this? Shoulder board. Well, groomed soldiers, not a hair out of place. They used coconut oil. The hell they did, in your planet, maybe. <laughs> you like a little torture, don't you? Here, this one, her tongue is too long. They use towels, so no finger marks. The bastard's enjoying himself. Slaves we were. Child slaves. Why is this child red? Burnt red. She was burnt on a radiator. This bloody heart with the cross and these exposed stomach organs that turns my stomach. Anything easier on the eye? Here, when the realms were happy. Why do you sleep? There's so much. So many flowers. These uh, trumpet flowers. <laughs> many good names for girls are flowers. One of the Vivian sisters is called Daisy. And one is Violet. I couldn't call one Rose. The flower is bigger than all the children. And this mushroom taller than the palm tree. You read Lewis Carroll? Yes, yes I have. I, I have an Alice from a coloring book, and I have the book somewhere right here. Darger picks up books from piles on the floor and throws them around. We see book jackets tumble across the scrim. Schmidt picks up a few and reads the spines, clouds of dust. Be careful, slow down. Oh, I know some of these. Brothers Grimm? Heidi, yes, kidnapped. The Prisoner of Zenda, Robinson Crusoe. The Wizard of Oz, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Oliver Twist, Little Eva David died 
five. Copperfield, Guardian my angel. father read that to me in German. Tough life. No father, no mother, no sister. But you lived with your father for how long before the institute? He got crippled, put me away in there. They said my heart was in the wrong place. Is it in my belly? I don't know. <laughs> heart in the wrong place? Sister. Taken away when mother died, I was four. Your sister? What was her name? Baby sister, Rose. Adopted. I wanted to be... You don't really know her name, do you? You tell yourself stories. My mother was Rosa. So you think of your sister as Rose? A good name, Sister Rose. You never saw her. Sister Rose is good. Agnes is evil. I need to go back to the precinct. I wasted time looking at all this crazy bits of paper, searching it. It's not going to be easy. I am an artist. What am I looking for? What? We're looking for the photograph. That's what you are looking for. I'm looking for clues. No, how do you live here, really? Your bed is completely covered. I need a method. Where do I start? These bundles, dime magazines, women's papers, detective pulp. Don't need scrapbooks. I suppose I should look through them. How do I separate it out? History, comedy, tragedy. How long this will take? I have no idea. I never, all this time, we see him pick up boxes, advertisements, catalogs I've seen. How many boxes of children's paints I've watched you buy? But how could ever dream it's... Hey, the story of the realms and the pictures of the realms are in all of these. I bind them with twine and the pictures are under here in pieces. I, I cannot put them together. No room. No, no room in this room. <laughs> You're telling me that I have to piece it together before I... Is that it? I will try. Why did I not come in here long ago? No more questions. Walter, if, if you come back and watch and hear, it will be clear. Act 2, Scene 5, November 1921. Small office inside St. Joseph's Hospital. <clears throat> when is the time to make a decision? When are you sure you have all the information you need beyond reasonable doubt? Why do you ask me? Go to your superior. No, no, no. He would not understand. Sister Rose, please. I heard you were understanding and kind, easy to talk to. I want to talk. I am a bride of Christ. What do I know of policing? Father Jerome, he is more worried. No, too much Latin. He is anxious. He is the soul of integrity. However, I am impressed. For someone who is obviously, forgive me, first generation. I read, Sister Rose, I read. To be honest, it's not about my job, it's about me. Yes. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who am I pursuing. Is he a sinner? Is he a saint? There are, in, uh, those are in fact, his words. Why do I persist? Why do I want to bring him down? That is what I have started asking myself. You see, I have no right to feel superior to someone who appears to have more of a sense of purpose than I have. More of a joy for life, for the world that he has made his life. More focused, more dedicated. Someone who loves his fantasy world and has a right to do that. What harm is there in that? In his world, he can, he can talk to all the creatures. The girls with horns, the tiniest child. He can be a brave general. I'm afraid you're making no sense. I do not know what you're talking about. But I have heard so much about you, Sister Rose. Please help me. Are you on some kind of quest? Pursuit? I suppose you could say that. And what are you hoping to achieve? I don't know. Whatever it is, the moment is lost. <laughs> I'm trying to work this out, but I'm sorry. I am lost. I thought it was going somewhere, but now I'm lost. And so, time stands still. I'm afraid and alone. You have no wife? No child? I can't believe this! No, no, no! I have no parents, no siblings, 
and no children, but what of it? I'm not asking for your pity. So what do you ask of me? Knowledge, support, understanding. Oh, that can only really come from God. Please, sister, don't duck out. I'm having trouble understanding. I understand parables. Can you describe it like a parable? Can I have some tea? <laughs> Yes, yes. I will call. How do you like it? Hot tea, lemon, three sugars. She opens the door of her office and disappears for a few moments. Schmidt looks at a picture of many of Mary surrounded by cherubs with girlish faces and barely noticeable penises. Sister Rose returns and shuts the door. Well, yes? Pardon? You're parable. You have had time to think. I will try. Not exactly sure what. Sometimes we can explain what troubles us better if we tell a story, like a sermon. You don't tell a factual story. You understand that. You extract the essence of it. It makes the story more beautiful, the emotions more poignant. So stand up now, my child. Begin. There was a man. A man who felt the misfit. People would sneer, shout, punish, and make him a scapegoat because he was different. One day something new happened. Out of the blue, he wandered onto a beach. He picked up a lump of sand. He decided that he could sculpt something. He had never had this feeling before. His heart was beating as he started to shaped the sand in his hands and molded. It, it, it began to look like something he was not sure what. He cupped his creation in his hand. He added water. It was really taking form. And then... Yes? And then all of a sudden it started to slip. Slip? Slip away through his fingers. Slowly. Grain by grain. There was nothing that he can do. Now, how does he feel? He doesn't understand what happened between the moment that he was building something from the materials he had and the instant it began to slip away from him. He feels the opportunity will never present itself again. He walks up to the picture of the androgynous cherubs. Perhaps he couldn't hold onto the sand because it became too hot to handle. He couldn't control it and he didn't know where. So you feel frustrated? I feel defeated. Why? I put everything into trying to nail this guy and I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Even who I am. Detective Schmidt. I have heard from Father Jerome that you harass his parishioner, Henry Darker, my employee. This has been done before, of course, police using an impoverished, vulnerable person to shape into the suspect that they need. <coughs> it is obvious to me now that you are using Henry, probably trying to frame him, force the confession out of him. <coughs> oh, yes? I read detective magazines. <laughs> Nuns are allowed to have fun, too, you know. <laughs> You, you get a thrill out of being a shadow, following, stalking a prey. Your, your intent is to wear him down. I have worn myself mm. down, worn out. Mr. Darker has had a difficult life. He finds much about life hard. I am fond of him. Sometimes I humor him. Recently, he filed a second application to adopt a Catholic child. Oh, I see that you didn't know that. I'm surprised. Adopt? Darker adopt a child? Of course. Is it unthinkable that a man of no means, unmarried... Who decides? Father Jerome, a panel. Catholic adoptions are complicated. I went along with the fantasy, you know, helped him fill out the forms. Let me guess, he specified a girl? He did. Of course, the petition was rejected, but I thought that just going through the process would be beneficial, make him feel he was connected to others. You see, after he was sent away by an alcoholic father, he had no one. Anyhow, he is stuck. Not long ago, he put in a second petition. This time I said I could not help. You asked for my advice? 
This is what I propose. Ask your final questions here today, and if you do not get a resolution, leave him alone. There you have it. Sister Rose, he will not... Good, I will get him. She leaves the room. The light begins to fade. Sister Rose returns with Darger muttering loudly. I am not sorry. Not sorry. Leave me alone. Well, well, I'm afraid, Detective Schmidt, we are not having a good day, are we, Henry? It seems, Detective Sister Agnes is not happy. Not happy at all. She said I blasphemed, and I did not. You blasphemed when she rebuked you. No, Sister Rose, I did not. Well, what did you say? I said seven plagues will come and ugly nuns like you will be struck down, and your bellies will be hacked open and torn to pieces until your Is blood enough? covers the sheet. Stop! <laughs> Sister Rose slaps Darker hard across the face. She lifts her hand again. Schmidt grabs it and holds Sister her hand Rose, down. please, that is not necessary. He's not a child misbehaving. If he becomes angry, it is because he cannot... Exactly. If he learns to control himself, I will not have to be severe. I will take him outside. <laughs> he can come down outside. Good day, sister. Come, Henry. Schmidt gently pushes Darger out with him. They walk down the corridor. Darger is muttering. I am a hard-boiled egg that does not crack. I know, Henry, I know. And you know what? Your sister Rose has a large hand. She is not my sister. You know, they, they saw that Sister Rose and Sister Agnes are little sisters of the poor, but really they are tall. <laughs> That's funny. Come, I will take you home, but first a cup of tea from <clears throat> Mr. Frank. What happened with Sister Agnes? She said I was crazy. I've never met a kind one. <laughs> They talk nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with you, Henry. I'm there. I'm right with you. Act 2, scene 6. Darger's room weeks later. Schmidt is sitting on a trunk eating an apple. Darger is making a collage. Rain and Sun Girl have a pile of paper dolls. Each girl dips a brush into red paint and works through the pile, covering the cutout dolls in red. This is magnified on a screen. Schmidt is reading to the girls from Darger's writings in a handbound book. They sit close to him. So the Glendalinians stood over thousands of children at the mills. After work on the big machines was done, all the little slave laborers were forced to scrub the floors. They tried, but they dropped out of exhaustion. But still, the Glendalinians gave them a beating and made them continue or get a four-hour lashing. One of the Glendalinians bawled out, You die for this disobedience! He beckons to Rain Girl and points to a place on the page. She stops what she's doing and shares the book with him, holding it in one hand. With the other, she holds up one cut-out figure, waving it to get it dry, but the red paint is dripping. I'm not afraid to die, said Joyce. If you kill me, I'll go to heaven all the quicker. Don't you know that children are more important to God than grown-ups? <laughs> Heaven, I will see that you sin first, said the Glendalinian general. You dirty little brat, I will make you suffer horribly. They carried in the dead body of a strangled child slave and also pieces of her heart and the liver. The Glendalinian said to Joyce, Open your mouth and eat these, or I will choke you as I did ha. <laughs> as he opened her mouth and tried to put in the pieces, she found a pistol that one of the Glendalinian generals had carelessly left, and she leveled it at him. Rain Girl gives the book to Sun Girl. I will not shoot you, she explained. I have a more suitable idea. After all that has happened to my sisters and me, you and your heathen officers, shall learn the wickedness of your ways. You, you will die the way you have punished. Too many child slaves. She puts her hands around Schmidt's neck and pretends to strangle him. He makes unreal choking sounds and starts to bounce his head like a ball of dogs. Stop! All of you, stop! How dare you! I hate you! He picks up a plaster saint on the mantelpiece and throws it. Now look what you've done, Henry. St. Agnes, not a good day. 
On my walk, a large piece of cardboard hit me on the nose, bleeding. Now a saint smashed. I'm a sorry saint. And you are feeling sorry for yourself. He goes to him with a handkerchief. The piece of red velvet, now very ragged, drops out. Sun Girl picks it up and wraps it like a scarf around a small <coughs> statue of an angel, which she puts on the altar. There. At least the people on the altar have someone new to play with. Take the typewriter. I will be quiet. I like the sound. Go on. As Darker types on his typewriter, we see his text on the screen. Rain and Sun Girl sit on the floor painting and coloring books. I have said this before, dear reader, but you can never hear it too often that the Vivian girls were beauties. The human language is utterly inadequate to describe the loveliness of the seven noble princesses. Indeed, their beauty could never be painted. It had to be seen for real. Violet, Joyce, Jenny, Angeline, Daisy, Hetty, and Catherine. On this particular day in the third month of the second year of the war, they had just had a narrow brush with the enemy. The enemy had fired a volley, but the little girls had dived behind some trees just in the nick of time, and the bullets flew past them without doing any harm. Darger looks up and sees that Schmidt has fallen asleep. He stops typing. He sits in front of Schmidt and starts sketching him. He stops, drinks noisily from a glass of water that holds a paintbrush, makes a pillow for his head from a rag, and places his head on the table close to Schmidt. Rain and Sun Girl circle around the sleeping Darger and Schmidt. Storm smudge the inky night we cannot see through this rain cloud. Grr! They are lost in the woods and have been traveling for days. But look! A general's headquarters up ahead. But which general? Our enemy or our friend? Two Dargers. They look the same. Is this enemy general, Henry Joseph Darger, on the side of the heathen Glanolinians, who chases lassos and captures us? Who strangles, disembowels, and beheads us? Who ties us up at the stake? Who executes us by firing squad? But we have two Dargers. Which is he? Is he the bad one? Which is he? Which is which? Picks up the sketch of Schmidt. And which is this? <laughs> Perhaps this is our strong and brave Henry Joseph Decker on the side of the Angelinians, and Abiyanya and Prostentia and Calvarinia. They look the same, but one is very, very bad. Grr! I'll have you note. One is just slightly taller. When they wait, maybe you will tell. Who knows? But we should keep awake. Keep awake with stories. You go first. They tiptoe away from the sleeping men. They pick up paintbrushes and mine some drum rolls. The story of how Jenny became insane. Abbreviated. <laughs> Very abbreviated. Jenny's coming. Poor Jenny. Pretty. Beyond a doubt, but a raving maniac. <laughs> she puts worms into her open wounds, so her blood is poisoned. She walks around stark naked. Her body is small and slippery, hard to grab her. And she will insist on brandishing a horrible dagger. Once in a while, she chews on her arms, hand or shoulders. My, my. I have never seen a prettier child in such a bad condition. Don't move, and she won't do anything. Look straight ahead. They're going to wake up soon. Yes, they are. So this will be a brief installment. In the sad adventures of Jenny, I can't remember how it happened that once she had a sore foot incurred from a bullet wound. She was fording a ravine, walking along the log, but she slipped from the log, slipped onto the decaying body of the soldier. In an effort to recover herself, she plunged both her hands into the soft, decaying flesh of the head, causing the hair to peel off the scalp. What did she do? What would you have done in her place? Oh, horror of horrors. No one who really had experienced this could bear to tell a story to their friends. Shh. Up. Scene seven, the church. Father Jerome has his back to us. He is bent over talking to a parishioner. Darger rushes in. Schmidt is some paces behind him and remains in the shadows. Darger is screaming. The parishioner runs off. Where under the sun 
do you think you have the right to wreck the lives of children? Oh, Mr. Darger, please, you cannot shout. I'm talking to a bereaved woman. This is private. I am bereaved. We are bereaved. I lost out on having a child, and she lost me. Henry Darger, you deprived her of a father. A father who would have given her milk when she was scared, given her coloring books of cowboys and Indians. A most fabulously fun father who would not be strict. How does it feel to be you, you evil? Henry, stop it. This is madness. You're ranting. You hate other people shouting. Leave me alone. No, Mr. Schmidt, I can handle this. No, God blesses you. Don't you dare touch me. It can be dangerous, Father. I'll, I'll be the judge of that. You think you are the supreme judge? You connived with God. Son, you are one of the most devout of my flock. We all have times when we think that God is not on our side. I will not give up. So I have formed a society. I am the supreme being. The protector, we take our responsibilities very solemnly. Company! Rain and Sun Girl appear carrying flags. Oath of Allegiance. We solemnly swear to uphold the rules of the Child Protection Society. Rule one, the child has a right to play. Rule two, the child has a right to be happy. Rule three, the child has a right to dream. Rule four, the child has a right, a right, um, I forgot, silly, a right to normal sleep of the night season. Rule five, the child has a right to an education. Rule six, the child has the right to equality of opportunity for development in all that is in us of mind and heart. Company cheer. Hooray for Henry Darker, the supreme leader. Hip, hip, hooray! Company, you are in grave danger. These people will never protect you. So march, and don't stop till I tell you. We will file another petition. <laughs> no, no, twice is enough. In, in fact, I, I, I don't think our rules will allow it. Is the Catholic Church a club? Father, this could get ugly. He is not your father, not my father, not anybody's Mr. father. Mr. Darger, my son, please. Company at ease. No, yeah, I need to go. Good Company, day. fall behind. Charge! He slips and falls on the floor. The girls kneel beside him and drape their flags over his body. Act 2, scene 8, Darger's room. Darger is hobbling around the room. Schmidt is reading a newspaper. I need it. Where is it? Go easy. You wouldn't have fallen if you hadn't polished the floor around the altar. Are what? you hiding it? What? Eat more fruit picture? Girl with grapes? Magazine? Vogue? Where is it? I put it under... If you cleared up this doghouse... And there was a girl eating a strawberry. Where is it? Help me move these shoes and lift... Schmidt flings assorted shoes around. What good are those? Not a pair here. How many? Forty? Why? Not even you can find a use for them. I'm reeking in this trash heap. I look and smell like a damn stupid hobo. It's not trash. I'm not a hobo. I am an author. I am an artist. Let's just admit it, shall we? With grand... You can't draw. You cut. You, you mix everything up. You told them I was... Carton, owl, over I a kid, that. upside down. You said I am a vandal. It's making me feel you sick. Your mind dirty, sadistic. I, I have to make a plan. Result. Christian. What are you talking about? Sister Rose told me to come to a resolution. Oh, really? Well, I have made a resolution. My celestial darlings, I have important news. While we were sleeping, this man secretly stole the photograph. He is a spy and a traitor. She weeps. 
keep in disguise as a Christian. <laughs> Gosh darn, he was becoming part of our story. Oh yes, your endless story. I'm little Annie Ehrenberg. How long have I been begging you to find my damn photograph? <laughs> he steals my words, sucks air out of my room, he mocks me. I am a fabulous artist. He took photographs of my paintings and stole their souls. And he stole my handkerchiefs, Irish linen handkerchiefs from the hospital every Christmas. He tore them out of the boxes. We have found him out. Now we ambush and disempower him. Repeat that after me. Now we ambush and disempower him. What's disempower? It will become self-evident. Watch and hear. Schmidt stands on a stool and turns his back on Darger. Oh, quasi court! Tell the court your name. Detective Walter Schmidt, Your Honor. Your testimony! Ah, uh, yes, Your Honor. Henry Darger's obsession with little girls is, 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 is uh, well, I don't know exactly, but if he didn't kill Elsie Perubek, did he want to? Or did he want to kill someone like her? Or did he tell himself he didn't want to? Or did he think he was her? Or did he know the difference? We should consider my exhibits, photographs, and the pictures. Oh, yes, I have a... What was Mr. Darger's relationship to you? I cannot explain that even to myself, Your Honor. Was he your captive? No. Did he capture you? In a manner of speaking, yes or no? Yes, but all that changed, Your Honor. When did it change? Uh, do I have to answer yes or no? I asked you an open-ended question. You did. Well, uh, his world became very stormy for him, and he became stormy, and an explosion was brewing, and, and I was frightened for my safety. Well, I'm off. So, Henry, <laughs> goodbye. I'm going now to my police station. This isn't going to be pretty for you, Henry. I'm delivering you up. Schmidt slams the door. The girls take Darger's hands. I thought he was my friend. Dear General Darger, the Vivian princesses will protect you. We cannot get Amy's body back. But we will finally have her picture back in our possession. The foe is about to be avenged even if we have to die in battle. No, no, my sweet angels. You have suffered enough. You and I. Peace will come soon now, you'll see. Sweet darlings, didn't I say I would protect you? Scene 9, the police precinct. I need to get to a card game. <laughs> you know, I only work short shifts now. What is this about? I have something that I have decided I should bring to your attention. Oh, yeah. I brought a camera <clears throat> into his room. I used the box camera. Sneaking equipment. Now, whose room? The results are tangible evidence, well, Chief. Let me get, get on. Let me it. take you there. You go up two flights. Dirty yellow paint on the walls. Skip. The story. Okay. The story is important, okay. but very well. I'll get to the photograph. Schmidt opens a large envelope and puts a photo on a desk. It is blown up on the screen. We are seeing a number of individual portraits of girls traced and enlarged using a drugstore printer. These tracings are then overdrawn, altered in some cases, with collage laid over the original figure. Watercolor washes. Yeah, I see. Oh, <laughs> Ginger Meg's little orphan Annie. Yeah, yeah he transforms yeah. Uh, what he cuts out. The girls are also known as princesses. Hetty, Daisy, Catherine, Angeline, Gertrude, Violet, Joyce, spelled Juliet, Oscar, Indian, Charlie, Echo. <laughs> Schmidt, is this a procedural? Exhibit B. This is one of the sunny pastoral. Yeah, yeah, paper dolls. The paper. girls staring into the emptiness as if. Oh, what do you know? There's little Annie Rooney. Indeed, 
his central victim is called Annie. And I firmly believe it is a, call, a code for Elsie. Ten years ago, a case that shook the city. Perubic? No, 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 you, you've got some nerve. You should to... see this one. He holds up a drawing where girls have male genitalia. So there you have it. Mother of Jesus, this is sick. What kind of a man is this? There is more. Schmidt hands pictures of slain girls and girls on crosses. Sick. I mean, he needs to be locked up somewhere, whoever he is. In quick succession, Schmidt hands him violent pictures. Title, Glandolinian Strangling Child. Title, Many of the Girls Tied to Slabs of Title, and Jenny Ritchie have thrilling time fleeing through a field of gutted bodies. Title, Strangling Child in the Sky. And whoever's still here, I'll go, I'll go round up who's here. They need to see this. You wait. He leaves and returns with two policemen. Look at these photographs. The work of a reclusive blue-collar worker <coughs> also writes stories based on the pictures, pictures based on the stories. Despite being a devout Catholic, he has a violent streak past these around. No, I, I'm too old to sensitize. Just to, so, tell me. So, very male genitalia on small naked girls. Yeah, some of them attempting to hide their dicks yeah. between their legs. But some naked girls are girls. I, I don't get the logic. Yeah, there's no logic in perversion. Schmidt, write all this down. Well, the half dressed in the same picture as the naked and, and, and half and naked. Now, that thing with wings and horns. This is funny. Funny. <laughs> Funny. No, no, no. He, he's right. There, there is some humor. Yeah, I think, I think that one has three dicks. Androgynous, or is it a, a hermaphrodite? Well, no breasts. Squirting more blood than a stuck pig. Oh, no, that, that's the sacred heart bleeding. That's not nice. I think the violence is child's play. Well, he's playing with children. <laughs> now that one has a stiff. Okay, and <laughs> now with respect to you all, you make it seem too crude. Look, bear in mind, he was raised in an institution. Look, I was upset with him, not his pictures. I stopped thinking that the pictures were... I have to report this up. I, I just, I, we may need federal law enforcement. Uh, Schmidt, you go now, you bring him in. You go and get him and bring him back in half an hour. And Schmidt... I, uh, I never thought I'd say this, but good work. It's a menace to the public. It's a demonic, but No, he's not a demon. When you watch him, he's tender. He talks to the girls as he works so tenderly, secret world, and, 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 and he cares about every detail. If if I had really wanted him apprehended, I would have shown you earlier. You're taking this too far. You idiot. I mean, you finally bring something in, and you blow it. Uh, get some balls. I mean, go, bring him in. I want him locked up tonight. I want to get to my card game. I, I need a drink. I, Schmidt, <laughs> wake up. Take your coat. It's freezing out there. Scene 10, Darker's room. Schmidt enters. It is dark. Darger stands in front of the fireplace. Rain and Sun Girl are gallantly stoking the dying embers. Henry, why are you in the dark? The light died. Landlady has no more light bulbs. She's gone to the store. It's so cold. You have to leave here, Henry. I have orders. I have to take you to the police station. No, he stays with us. They point their fire pokers like swords at Schmidt. <laughs> you are a stupid man. You escaped. You compounded your crime. Punishment presses hard on the heels of a crime. You don't get it, do you? Wake up. First you stole the picture, then you bring a camera. Oh, stop that. You have to understand. They are all waiting at the station, waiting for you and me. He isn't going anywhere. Soon the policemen with guns, not toy soldiers, will be here. My Vivian girls lead huge armies of child slaves in 
and they can take on any onslaught. The girls take daughter's hands. We can make it clear that you're crazy. You're Not sane. crazy. Really? The nut house is better than prison. I am a sane Christian. I am doing my Christian duty. Let's go quietly. If you answer their questions, then maybe they will let you go. Do you ever say anything that is true? Mm. You won't come easy. <laughs> right. I get reinforcements. I have to warn you. They're about to ask you a question. They like to torture in my precinct. I swear to God they do. So you can help yourself by telling me now, Henry Darger. Is Annie Ehrenberg Elsie Perubik? What a silly question, Walter. She's on the side of the angels, Walter. It is a mystery, Walter. I have waited so long. I have tried so hard. I have worked so hard. I ask questions, but you ignore me. I plead. You torture me with the games you play with me. How will I ever know? You can ask her. They will take you to her. She is hiding out at Caroline Ridge. She will tell you. She will judge. You are either a sinner and will face a firing squad, or she will release you from captivity. It is in her hands. Oh, my darlings. The cat-headed Blendon will look after you. I will meet you shortly at Sunbeam Creek. Come, Walter. <coughs> Don't be afraid. It isn't far. The girls pick Schmidt up. He does not resist. They lead Schmidt through the flap in the middle of the two halves of the darker picture that we saw in the first scene. The girls go with him, leaving <coughs> Darger bathed in light. Darger puts music on his phonograph. He slowly walks around the room, looking fondly at all of his treasures. Then he, too, steps into the picture. Act 2, scene 11. Policemen knock on Darger's front door. The landlady opens it. Yes? Good evening, ma'am. We have a warrant to search the room of one of your tenants, Henry Darger. Another officer is already there. I didn't see anyone. What has he done? He's a danger to society. That's plain crazy. Where is his room? Two flights at the back. There's no light. I said I would buy a light bulb. I gave the last one to another tenant yesterday. I'll go now. I, I warn you, the room smells bad. He doesn't want me to clean or replace anything. Thank you, ma'am. They climb the stairs up to the room. This dirty yellow paint. Henry Dogger! Schmidt! 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 They find the door open. They enter. It is dark. Dogger! Schmidt, you're in here. Obviously not. How do you know? Well, it's not that dark. They're not here. They must have left already. It's protocol. Quick, quick search before we leave. Now they're on their way back to the station. But we should go. You were right. We just missed them. Look. We'll get out of here, but, but a, a, a quick search. How? It's too dark. There's no point. But what are you searching for, anyway? Check that they're not here. Well, what are you talking about? Somewhere in the house. What for? Schmidt says he lives in one room. Dinks! The place sure fits the profile. He takes back some of these pictures then. You gonna help me or not? I don't want to. I, I don't know where to start. Darger's kidnapped Schmidt. I'm taking him somewhere. I got this sick feeling. Where? If she could bring up that damn bulb, at least we could pick up some of that art. So many papers here, but <laughs> I can't see. Art? A pervert? Say this. Hello? Henry? Is Henry out? I have a light bulb. I need to put it in. Lady, you can't, can't, can't step a foot in here. This may be a crime scene. He is a lonely, deeply devout man. Minds his own business. <coughs> pays his rent. Are you sure you have the right person? He uses different names. You have a name that could also be someone else. Oh, we have the right man. Yes. Anyway, he's gone, so you shouldn't be here. Come back another time. Thank you for the light bulb. We'll be gone soon, but we're under instructions. It's a serious matter. We need to take away some incriminating material. We need you to leave, man. We'll be we'll be leaving soon. Oh, you have a telephone? 
No, my neighbor. Call us at the, 15, at the 15th precinct as soon as he returns. Shut the front door when you leave. Oh, uh, uh, just a minute, ma'am. Yes? Did he ever seem strange to you? He talked sometimes in voices. You could hear him from downstairs, but I wouldn't make too much of that. I have tenants who like Dr. Uh, Mr. Kotzlowitz upstairs. He plays the violin all night. We all get used to these little quirks. My husband and I, we are our waves and our strays, and we are fond of... One of the policemen puts in a bulb. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Ah! At last! Light! God, take a look at all this. The paints, the, the, the string. It's like a factory here. War stories, magazines. Nothing but bundles of papers. It's damp. Some of them are starting to... Listing some bundles and finding a folder of paintings. This is beautiful. Look at it. The colors. The movement. I never knew. With lady, we told you to step outside. We need to finish. And we have to get back to the station. This is urgent. I'm going. Is she gone? Uh, yeah. So these are the paintings. There's no time to choose which... Look, we'll grab, we'll grab these. Uh, no, wait. But that, that soldier, the face, it looked to you like Schmidt. He uses the same cutouts. His faces are all the same. No, no, they're not. This is a portrait. It's a dead ringer. Plus, he's, 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 he's mopping his brow with a handkerchief. Doesn't matter, winter or summer, Schmidt does that. Ever since I've known him. It's been a long day. We're nearly through. Look, I got what we need. We're done. Now let's get out of here. I will be happy to see Schmidt. Now turn out that light, will you? Fade to black. Fade up on that lady hovering in the doorway of the room. She walks to the angel on the mantelpiece with the red velvet scarf that some girl had carefully placed there. She picks it up. Henry, I wish you would have shown me. I wish you could have explained it to me. I wish you had explained as you worked. God, the children, there's so many children, but where? There are no mothers, no fathers, only soldiers. Why, Henry? Why? Why? Because children are always alone. I try to help them with all my might. But when something happens, it breaks my heart. It is so very sad when the sweetest of sweet child is left behind and lost. She disappeared into the placid waters of the river. I thought, sure, I saw the beautiful child in the water with lily pads all around her. All I could see was her face, her eyes so large and such an imploring look at them. And her arms were extended as if beckoning me to come. As if beckoning me to come. As if beckoning me to come. End of play.